1857, the entire companies of the Army of the East India Trading Company were in open mutiny. Thousands of men turned on their British officers and massacred hundreds of British civilians. Once the mutiny was eventually suppressed, the powerful East India Trading Company was stripped of its holding in India, with the British government taking control of the subcontinent. In today's video, we will cover the rise and fall of the East India Trading Company, and the factors that fermented mutiny and the blood events that would shape the British Raj. It is from the mid 18th century, vast recruitment led to the creation of three major company armies, the Bombay, the Madras and the Bengal armies. The primary drive for these forces was to combat the French forces stationed in India. Many young British officers first gained recognition whilst serving alongside company soldiers, a notable example being Arthur Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington. In 1757, the British forces were able to defeat the French-backed Nawab of Bengal, installing a new Nawab who was friendly to the East India Trading Company. Bengal and its wealth was now under direct control of the company, boasting the largest of the three company armies. By the early 1800s, the army numbered over a quarter of a million strong. The factors can be roughly split into two main groups, material conditions of the soldiers and the perceived threat posed by the company to the Indian way of life. Soldiers of the Bengal army would often live in mud and thatch huts that they would have to build themselves. Many of the younger, competent soldiers would find themselves stuck in a low rank, as promotion was based upon time served. Older, non-commissioned officers would often not want to leave the army, as they would often only end up with a rather small pension, despite the time served. And they would not be permitted to rise above the rank of sergeant, the armies of the East India Trading Company were a major symbol of the company's power, both over the subcontinent and over its people. The soldiers were trained in the European methods of waging war that proved to be effective against the native Indian armies. Very often, the company forces would be deployed alongside armies belonging to the princely states of India. These were semi-autonomous regions which had close ties to the company but not controlled. Through trade and by lending its strength, the East India Trading Company held a great sway over much of India. What's more, the company would begin to acquire territory through what is known as the Doctrine of Lapse. This is where if a leader of a princely state were to pass without a biological male heir, the company would claim dominion over the land. This was in direct contradiction to the usual Indian practice of such rulers appointing their own successors, which did not have to be down to the European patrilineal lineage route favoured by the company. Under the governor generalship of James Ramsay, no less than seven major states were acquired in this manner between 1848 and 1854. With these circumstances, many of the soldiers believed that the British were in the process of removing traditions and planning to convert the population to Christianity. The key example that is often given to this belief is the issuing of Enfield rifles and the new cartridges to go with it. These rifles were first introduced in 1853, four years before the start of the mutiny. Whilst there were no complaints in the first few years, the East India Trading Company in London were not impressed by any suggestion that the origin of the grease, that is pork or beef, might offend Indians. As the cartridge had to be bitten off to be used, any Hindu or Muslim soldiers would be contravening their faith. In January of 1857, the fat used on the cartridge was to be changed. Instead, the soldiers were to be given ungreased cartridges so that they could use any fat that they so wished. But then, a rumour started that the paper itself contained the offending animal products, and that the flour rations contained ground up bones of pigs and cows. It is widely held that the cartridges were the key factor for the mutiny, but this could instead be seen as a symptom of growing mistrust in the company, 
or as the straw that broke the camel's back. Either way, the mutiny shortly followed. What is seen as the first instance of mutiny is attributed to the actions of Mengal Pandi, a Sepoy in the Bengal army. On the 29th of March 1857, Pandi had taken his rifle and was urging his fellow infantrymen to revolt against the injustices of the East India Company, one of which was that the cartridges would turn the Sepoys into infidels. A British officer named Lieutenant Bohr was informed and set about to deal with the unrest. Bohr was shot at and slashed with a Talwar blade, as more British officers joined in the fray. Whilst some Sepoys attempted to stop Pandi, many watched the fight between the Sepoy and officers. Some even attacked the officers and ordered that the detained Pandi be released. Pandi in the end shot himself, but he survived the bullet wound. He was tried and executed by hanging on the 21st of April 1857. As word spread of Pandi's actions, more and more regiments rose in mutiny. On the 24th of April at Meerut, a group of Sepoys from the 3rd Bengal Light Cavalry Unit refused to use the now infamous cartridges during a fire exercise. The soldiers were sentenced to hard labour and imprisonment, with the entire company made to watch as the rebellious soldiers were ceremoniously stripped of their ranks and uniforms before being sent to their cells. The next day, the imprisoned Sepoys were sprung from jail and the armories were ransacked. In the carnage, around 20 British civilians, including 8 children, were murdered. Around 50 Indian civilians were killed and many attempting to hide the employers from the rebels. Many of these soldiers made their way to Delhi to continue the rebellion, often gaining support from Indian civilians as they sought to reclaim India. At Delhi, the soldiers petitioned Bahadur Safar, the elderly and largely powerless Mughal ruler of the city. By this point, soldiers from other regiments had flocked to ask Zafar to aid them in defeating the East India Company. The largely Hindu and Muslim soldiers believed that Zafar's neutrality as to the religions and his influence would help their cause. Zafar in the end listened to the Sepoys and accepted, if somewhat reluctantly, to act as the head of the mutiny. With Zafar as the head, entire regiments of Bengali soldiers either joined the Sepoys or refused to act against the mutineers. On the 11th of May, the British officers in command of the city's arsenal attempted to fight the Sepoys. Fearing the vast stockpile of gunpowder and arms might fall into the rebel hands, they blew up the arsenal with the resulting explosion killing many in the streets nearby. The British soldiers that were still in the city were rounded up and murdered. After Delhi was taken, many cities fell to the growing mutiny, eager to rid themselves of British rule. Massacres of British civilians were carried out by the rebels, as years of resentment was unleashed. In the city of Kanpur, the town was besieged by the mutineers, with the city's commander, General Hugh Wheeler. The general was hoping to rely on the support of a local leader named Sahib Peshwa II. Sahib was on the receiving end of the doctrine of lapse. Under his adoptive father's will, Sahib was the presumed heir to the throne. In addition, he would have inherited his adoptive father's pension of around £800,000 a year from the East India Company. However, after the death of his father, the company refused to grant him the pension on the basis that he was not the biological son. Instead of siding with the British, Sahib assumed command of the rebels. In the last week of June, Wheeler agreed to surrender, as there was not enough supplies for a long siege. General Wheeler's condition for surrender was that the soldiers, women and children would be given safe passage out of the city. Sahib accepted this, and on the 27th of June, the British set aboard boats that would take them to safety. However, they were attacked by rebel soldiers. The boats were burned, and the majority of the men were murdered, including General Wheeler. The fate of the women and children, according to W.J. Shepard, was as follows. When the males had all been put to the sword, 
The order to cease firing was given by the cavalry, and the poor women and children that survived were brought out of the river and collected on the bank. Many of them were wounded with bullets and sword cuts. Their dresses were wet and full of mud and blood. They were then ordered to give up whatever valuables they might have hid upon their persons. Those who survived the attack were taken to a building called the Bibaha, which roughly translates to the House of Ladies. Conditions there were poor, meaning the 200 or so women and children held captive fell to illness, many dying from dysentery or cholera as a result of the squalid conditions. When it was clear that the British were about to reclaim the city, Sahib ordered the remaining women and children to be murdered. Initially, the rebels refused the orders to shoot into the house to kill the women and children. But, an execution squad led by Sahib's bodyguard entered the building and methodically killed the prisoners with swords, knives and hatchets. The dead and the dying were then stripped, mutilated and dumped into a well. The British soldiers who discovered the bodies were now eager to take out retributive justice on the rebels. Stories of the massacre reached the British public who were eager for terror to be met with terror, with barbarity to be met with barbarity. The city was retaken on the 16th of July and the rebel sepoys were arrested. The British then made their captives clean the blood from the floor of the Bilbaguer, and they were made to clean it with their tongues. A series of gallows were erected next to the well where the bodies were dumped, so that the rebels would die within sight of their massacre. Some mutineers were tied across the barrels of cannons, and the cannons were then fired, a punishment from the days of the Mughal Empire which was adopted by the British. Sahib was never found, with many believing he fled to Nepal. The British were ultimately able to mount counter-attacks and retake the cities that were taken by the rebels. The region of Punjab and its largely Sikh population were not sympathetic to Mughal rule, based on previous oppression. Whilst some sepoys from Punjab did mutiny, many went straight to Delhi, and formed up with other rebels. Many of the mutineers, however, were rounded up and arrested or killed by company forces loyal to the British. In addition to the regular soldiers, poorly trained militias were called upon from the Sikh community and the Pakhtun community to join in the fighting, with over 30,000 joining in the cause. The fact the British held the Punjab, having a secure base and having soldiers they could count on not to rebel proved to be vital, with Sikh troops largely responsible for retaking Delhi. As cities were retaken, the British forces enacted their bloody vengeance. Orders of take no prisoners were made, often no distinction made between mutineers or civilians caught up in the war. One young officer involved in the effort to retake Delhi was named Edward Vilbart. Edward had lost most of his family in the massacre. He said, the orders went out to shoot every soul. It was literally murder. I have seen many bloody and awful sights lately, but such a one as I witnessed yesterday, I pray I never see again. The women were all spared, but their screams on seeing their husbands and sons butchered were most painful. Heaven knows I feel no pity, but when some old grey bearded man is brought and shot before your very eyes, Hard must be that man's heart, I think, who can look with no indifference. Any sepoy from a regiment that had mutinied, who could not give a proper account for his actions, was to be hanged. However, the murder of civilians was all too common. In one district in Delhi, around 1,400 unarmed civilians were murdered by sword and bayonet. Those suspected of ties with the mutineers would face horrific torture such as chilli powder applied to the eyes of prisoners. Eventually in 1858, the British had regained control of the subcontinent. One of the first problems to be tackled was the reorganisation of the company armies. There was to be a permanent garrison of British army troops serving only in India. To avoid a repeat of the Indian soldiers ever rebelling again, two innovations were essential. 
The proportion of native to British troops was not to be allowed to exceed two to one, and the artillery was to be almost exclusively in the hands of the Crown's forces. In the Bengal army alone, the number of Indian infantry regiments and the number of men in each was reduced from 146 to only 72. By 1861, there were around 70,000 British troops compared to the 135,000 Indian troops. In addition, reforms such as better access to promotion were put in place to avoid any further disenfranchisement of its soldiers. Finally, there was the effect of the mutiny on the civilian population of India. The traditional society and those seen as the rightful rulers of India had protested the foreign influence of the British and they had failed. From this point, all serious hope of revival of the ways before the European occupation evaporated. A British class system, from which emerged a strong Indian middle class with heightened sense of Indian nationalism, would soon push its own aims, often seeing the British as a potential partner, though one they would seek to gradually replace. By the end of the rebellion, around 6,000 of the 40,000 British living in India had been killed, either in the fighting, from disease, or murdered in the massacres carried out by the rebels. Many more sepoys loyal to the British perished during the conflict, and this is believed to be in the tens of thousands. Many more thousands of rebel sepoys were killed or executed following the suppression of the mutiny. It's thought that anywhere between 500,000 to 1 million Indians died as a result of the mutiny. Many murdered by vengeful British soldiers or in a series of famines that swept the affected regions. After the rebellion was quashed, the British government enacted the Government Act of India 1958 which stripped the East India Trading Company of its control of India. Whilst the infrastructure established by the company was to remain, the British government formed the Indian colonies. In addition, Queen Victoria issued a decree that her new subjects were to be granted rights and protections similar to those enjoyed by the other subjects of the British Empire. The uprising gave the perfect opportunity for the British government to take control of India. The Indian Mutiny of 1857 was the result of the fear of complete dominion of the Indian populations by the British. There was a real fear amongst the Indian sepoys that their culture, religion and traditions were to be supplanted. There is no doubt that the atrocities were committed by both the rebel sepoys and the British. News articles and books published in Britain painted the actions of the sepoys as barbarous and were contrasted with the heroic deeds by the British officers, whose own barbarity was lauded as acceptable and just. When the Indian independence movement gained support, the mutiny and rebellions of 1857 were viewed as having been an early battle for independence, and the likes of Pandey were regarded as national heroes. It would not be until 1947 that India would gain its independence, which is another bloody story for another day. The mutiny should be remembered as one of the first largely unified attempts to remove the British from India. It is however important to remember that many Indians, notably those from Punjab, supported the British. It is a large and complex tale, and one that I encourage you to read further. It is important to look at our collective history and the cycles of violence that continue to drive atrocity after atrocity, and to remember those needlessly murdered for petty revenge.